Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings and mercy of God be with all of you. Uh, my name is Azhar Usman. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be included in this uh, wonderful program uh, with Celebrate Mercy. We've been talking about the Isra and the Mi'raj, the uh, miraculous night journey of the Prophet and the heavenly ascent uh, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God bless him and keep him, uh, had undergone. Uh, this is definitely by the consensus of the scholars of Islam, one of the most significant events uh, of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After the Prophet returns from this miraculous night journey and from this ascent, which by definition is a miracle because it was something that was utterly inexplicable. It could not be understood by the rational intellect. In fact, it challenges the rational intellect because if someone were to tell you, even today, that they had done this incredible thing of traveling from Mecca to Jerusalem in a single night on a winged horse-like creature and then ascended into heaven, if someone were to say that today in this world, the vast majority of us certainly would say this person is not telling the truth. This person is crazy. This person is having hallucinations, etc. So of course, even in the time of the Prophet, most people responded similarly, and they immediately began to deny and disbelieve in what the Prophet ﷺ was saying. Of course, he was telling the truth. And those who believed in him never doubted for an instant. Uh, the famous response of Abu Bakr, his best friend, and who, who went on to become the first caliph of Islam, is something that really is a reminder for the believers as to how we should relate to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what happens with him is that before he hears it from the Prophet's own mouth, he hears people talking about the Prophet's claim of having gone on the Isra and the Mi'raj. And the moment the story reaches his ears, Abu Bakr neither confirms nor denies it. What he says is, if the Prophet Muhammad said this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he said this, then it's true. So in other words, it's very, very interesting how he responded. He, he doesn't immediately say, okay, well, I'm gonna take a position on this story, because his thing is like, hey, you people are kuffar, you're Quraysh from Mecca, you guys are hating on the Prophet, so why should I believe that this is even true, what you're saying? But if what you're saying is true, he did make these claims, then I believe it. And this is the condition of the believer, the true believer, anything he hears from the Prophet, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا As the Qur'an says, we hear it and we obey. Whatever the Prophet has brought, we take it with 100% certainty that he is only teaching us and telling us what God, the all-merciful, all-powerful creator of the universe has indeed taught him. An important message, an important teaching that comes out of this story for us as believers, and that is the correct relationship between reason and revelation. We should never as believers fall into the modern trap of thinking that revelation must submit to reason. In fact, this is exactly backwards. Reason must submit to revelation. When we read Quran, when we read the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, God bless him and keep him, we try to understand what these words are saying we, with our minds, of course we do. And we never approach the Quran saying, well, if it doesn't make sense to me and my intellect, then I reject it. And the Qur'an is very critical of people who do that, asking, do you take part of the book and reject part of the book? Because this is not the way of a true believer. And this unfortunately has become a big problem in the time we live in, because we have become hyper-rational, scientific people who want to, uh, everything to comport to the boundaries of our intellect, our rationality, and the boundaries of reason, including the Qur'an. This is not the way it works. The Qur'an tells us, what is the true nature of reality, and then we comport our beliefs, our understandings of the world, our empirical scientific exploration and experimentation with the dictates of Quran. And finally, what's also important about this deen, Islam does require us and ask us to believe in certain miraculous realities. And yet at the same time, nothing that it asks us to believe in or nothing that it demands the believer believe in, is actually something that goes against the intellect. That is to say, and this is a subtle point, there's nothing in Islam that is anti-rational. 
There's nothing in Islam that is irrational. There's nothing in Islam that's counter-rational. There are miraculous events in Islam that are supra-rational, that are extra-rational. That is to say, we regard rationality and reason to be a very powerful tool that God has given us. And part of understanding that rationality is to rationally understand that the human mind and the human intellect has limits. That is something that we arrive at even through our own rationality. That there is knowledge beyond the intellect. And of course the believer understands that that, that, that reality, the ultimate reality, is God Himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does the true believer do? He or she submits to this reality. And it's interesting that even in the prayer, the Muslim salat, the canonical prayer, when we bow and when we prostrate, we are literally putting our brains, our minds on the ground. And in that position, what do we say? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Glorified, perfect is my Lord, the High, the Exalted One. So as the believer is humbling himself or herself, putting ourselves in the most low position we possibly can, and putting our mind and our intellect bowing down to the Lord of the Universe, we're at the same time glorifying God and recognizing the exalted position that God enjoys, which is absolutely above and beyond the intellect. So with that, we conclude our discussion regarding the Isra and the Mi'raj, reminding ourselves that this event was so important, so miraculous, and so essential to what makes the Prophet the Prophet. And the lesson we can learn from that is how to properly relate our minds and intellects to the divine reality, and to realize that through the Salat, through the prayer every day, the goal should be to experience our own ascent, to be able to taste a little bit of that mystical and metaphysical reality. We pray that God gives us that ability and gives us that gift, inshallah.